Bonjour Patrick. Um, hello, Patrick. Uh, please join me in this um, Illuminate Speaker series. Uh, series. Um, hello, Patrick. We are really pleased to hear from you. Uh, so I'm going to present you a little bit and uh, talk to people about the uh, title of your presentation. So Dr. Patrick Enaf is full professor within the School of Engineer at the University of Lorraine, which is in France. He is the head of the research department um, called Complex System Artificial Intelligence and Robotics. Uh, his research interests lie in uh, the bio-inspired control of human robotics, robots, and he is really passionate, passionate about studying artificial intelligence, interactive robotics, and neural control. The title of the presentation for today will be Plastic Neural Controller for Emergence of Moral Coordination in Physical and Social um, physical and social human robot uh, interaction. Uh, Patrick, we have around uh, 10 to 15 person here in the room. We have about uh, 30 person watching you online and uh, all those people will uh, hear your voice. So uh, you can start when you want. We will give you around 30 minutes maybe and then we have room for a uh, few questions from the people here in the room. Here you go.
sabi ko. Manual task are um, done manually and corresponds to, like we can see in this video, corresponds to rhythmic um, activities, rhythmic movement. Um, so one question is, how can we do uh, the same? I mean, replace the human by the robot, make have two robots interacting by the human, or how we, we can control the robot to avoid the human, uh, uh, to avoid some uh, new uh, um, musculoskeletal troubles on the on the on the human. Or how, what are the human movements? There is a lot of definitions, of course, from medicine, from uh, robotics, etc. But me, I like to to present two kind of uh, rhythmic movement of movements. Uh, first, rhythmic movements, and second, discrete movement. Rhythmic movements are like, for example, locomotion when we are walking, running. So these movements are on the legs, and when we are cleaning surfaces or brushing. It's rhythmic movement coming from the arm, from the upper part of the body. And also in sports, when we are playing basket, for example, we, are, um, uh, we generate uh, some uh, rhythmic movement with the arms. But we have also discrete movement in our behaviors, uh, which can be static, for example, taking an object on a table. Uh, it is static because we do that with several low velocities. But it can be also dynamic in sport. And for example, in basket, we have also discrete movement when we receive a, a ball, for example, or when we want to get a ball, to, to, sorry, to send a ball to a person. So the two, these two movements, rhythmic movements and discrete movements, are combined together to generate uh, some complex movement in our behavior with other persons. And if we are looking at these two kinds of movement, we can say that for upper limbs, for the arms of the human, rhythmic movement are not regular, are non-regular movement. Uh, but discrete movement can be regular. I mean, uh, we do more discrete movement with the, with the upper, limbs, upper limbs than rhythmic movement. And for lower limbs, it's inverse. We rhythmic movements are more regular for the legs but not discrete movement. Uh, when we are playing football, we can run and then shoot in the ball, so it's a discrete movement. So we, we have these two kinds of movement, rhythmic and discrete, and they are combined together to create complex movements. And we will see at the end of the presentation how we can uh, reproduce this kind of movement um, by several models. So rhythmic movements are very primitive and automatic uh, movements. And in um, interpersonal coordinations between two persons, um, uh, we observe that uh, interpersonal coordination are often based on rhythmic movement. And for example, <coughs> sorry, uh, this rhythmic movement have several very interesting properties. <clears throat> the first one is that uh, we have several involuntary interpersonal coordinations. For example, in the work, when several persons are working together, are, are working together, sorry, <clears throat> we observe that after several seconds or several steps, uh, the legs are synchronized and the person are working at the same frequency, at the same, with the same coordination. So it is an unconscious coordination that emerges, that appears between the persons. Um, it's the same for applause. Uh, it, uh, it has been observed that uh, several persons want 100, several hundred persons applause in a big room. Then we can observe emergence of one frequency. So the persons globally are applauding together. 
So this is very interesting because it is a coordination of movement between two persons or several persons without any programming before, without any measurement. It is in consciousness, and we will see that these properties comes from come from a specific um, systems we have uh, in spinal cord. And um, uh, the second example in the slide here correspond to very well-known behavior or so that, uh, that we can uh, reproduce. And this experiment shows that um, it is impossible to, um, or it is very difficult for the human to uh, go uh, against these uh, natural coordinations between the other persons. So we have this natural coordination that emerges, and it is difficult for us, or it is non-natural, to change this coordination. And then this interpersonal coordination is the based on synchronization of movement. I mean the movements are synchronized together. When we have contact between the persons, or when we don't have any contact with the persons with different kind of movements. So this part of what I am saying is uh, very studying in uh, psychology and expert on psychology. So for robotics, it, it is interaction because we can imagine that two robots can work together or work with a, one robot who is working with a human without any specific programming. We just use the properties of emergence. <clears throat> and if we observe this um, emergence of synchronization uh, between two persons, uh, we can see that uh, this, uh, for alterna alternative movement, like uh, is uh, showing in this picture, that after several movements, the two persons are looking together, they are acting um, a movement with their arms, and then we can see that uh, the coordination emerges and the synchronization emerges in two different uh, phases, with phase, I mean zero phase, or in antiphase, opposite phase. So the movement are in phase or are in antiphase, and it is <coughs> naturally, um, I think, like that. I mean, it's uh, you can observe that uh, the two persons are going in phase or in antiphase, but in the two cases they are synchronized together in phase or in antiphase. If we analyze this by the signals, we can see here in the pictures the different signals, and we can see on the right that uh, if we plot or if we show, sorry, the uh, path plan of the signals, we can see that we have a um, limited seek in the movement independently of the initial conditions. It means that the two persons converge automatically, naturally there to the same oscillation, to the same dynamical, dynamical systems. And this characteristic on the right here is a characteristic of uh, dynamical six systems. So the two persons are dynamic, uh, can be considered, each person can be considered to a dynamic system. And when they interact together uh, through a, a rhythmic interaction, then they, became, they become um, a global dynamic system. So this is also interaction, inter interesting, sorry, because um, this kind of trajectories of a dynamic system is very well known in physics. It is uh, like um, two non-linear oscillators. I mean, um, we can consider each person like a dynamical oscillator, non-linear oscillators, and they, ha they exchange some signals through the, um, through the, the, um, the eyes uh, when they observe the other person, and then some coupling appears and it becomes a global uh, a dynamical system which is very stable in its oscillating. So we can reproduce this with um, this very interesting experiment, and I advise you to do that with your students if you can. So we have some um, pendulum, and we can start this pendulum, uh, this one, independently of the, of the other pendulum. And then each pendulum has almost the same frequency, one frequency than the other. And we can observe that the accelerate is um, zero. We can observe that after several seconds, several seconds, six seconds, sorry, or um, three minutes, 
only one frequency appears, and at the end, it emerges a global coordinate movement for, from each of the whole um, pendulum. This is very interesting because um, each pendulum is uh, independent of, of to the other, but each pendulum is able to sense the vibration or the oscillation of the other pendulum by the, the place where the, the artist is. And then it appears naturally uh, this oscillation. And so if we consider some complex robotic system like uh, the robot on the left of the uh, oak is here, famous uh, um, salamander robots, or some multi leg robots here, we can consider that we can consider that one robot is um, uh, or one leg is uh, one leg is like or one module is like uh, or one element of the body of the robot is like uh, one oscillator here. So if we use this uh, natural property of the dynamical system, then we can suppose that we can uh, we will have some coordinations in the legs of the robot or in different parts of the robots, okay? So the question now is how can we model this kind of oscillators? Uh, before uh, proposing some models, we can observe some experimentation also between humans. One uh, interesting um, rhythmic movement between humans is hand shaking. If we made some experiments like we did in the laboratory between a lot of persons, we can measure the force and the, the frequency uh, of the persons by, um, by uh, fixing different uh, IMU on the arms. We can observe that uh, the accelerations between the two arms uh, are going with to um, a synchronization. Here on this picture, uh, on the left, bottom on the left, you can see first the accelerations of the two persons and before the contact, during, just after the contact of the hands, so there is a transition phase, and after several seconds, there is a mutual synchronization phase where the two arms are synchronized through this coupling and through this mechanical coupling. So we have here um, an idea, or we have here a proof that uh, in human human interactions, human human physical interactions, this emergence of synchronizations appears also. And uh, the question is how this movement are generated and controlled by the body. It is very well known um, um, in science that uh, rhythmic movement are generated by by uh, um, neural structures uh, um, in, uh, in uh, located in the spinal cord, sorry, and these neural structures are involved in the control and the, the generation of uh, rhythmic movement. These neural structures are called central pattern generators. There is a lot of publication on central pattern generators in medicine, in robotics, and it is well known that these uh, central pattern generators, sorry, called CPGs, it is well known that these CPGs are involved in locomotion of, uh, of, um, of animals, of um, mammalians and non-mammalian animals. And it is, we suppose also that they are involved in the locomotion of human and in the rhythmic movement of, uh, of humans. Uh, the problem is the, modeli the model of this kind of uh, CPGs and um, these CPGs also can exhibit rhythmic or discrete movement. Actually, it is one hypothesis. So the premise of this model is that we don't have any mathematical model, some, just some description. And one very interesting description is proposed by Macria and Ribach here since several years on these uh, pictures. So they said that, okay, CPGs are group of neurons that we can um, simplify of this, uh, by these pictures, so this model. At the first level, we have rhythmic neurons, uh, so, so it calls the rhythmic uh, generator uh, level. At the second level, we have um, um, pattern formation networks where some neurons are um, 
uh, inhibitory neuron can modulate the signals coming from the rhythmic levels. And after we have the motor neurons, that is, which is an interface between the CPGs and the muscles. And what is very important is that uh, we know also that several signals coming from the body can change the activities of these three uh, levels, motor neurons levels, pattern formation levels, and rhythmic levels. These structures can act automatically to generate movement, but it can also receive also some signals from the, um, from the uh, uh, MLR part of the brain, and these signals can start, for example, the movement and stop the movement. But the movement can go in uh, itself automatically and controlled by, by this kind of structures. And recently, or more recently, the authors propose um, um, some um, interesting uh, details of uh, bilateral left-right interaction between these structures, for example, for the left legs and the right leg, or left arms and the right arm. So they propose the same um, description with more information. I mean, the level, rhythmic level, the um, um, pattern formation levels, and the motor neurons level. And they say that, okay, we have some inter neurons here that can change the activities of the neurons, okay? And we have interactions, we have connections, we have inhibitory and excitatory connection from the left side to the right side. And also we have in the same CPG, we have internal inhibitory and excitatory co connections to control the extensor activity and flexor, flexor activity of muscles or of a group of muscles. So you can imagine this structure controlling a leg or or her arms, one for the left arm, one for the right arms, and controlling the extensor muscles and flexor muscles of the arm, okay? Um, um, the problem is that this, this uh, description is not a mathematical model. So we have to, in, to understand this kind of description, this kind of scheme, to propose a mathematical model. And to do that, we have to simplify uh, or to, 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 to describe this for robots, for example. So if we have signals coming from the, uh, from the brain, we can control the CPG of the left arm, the CPG of the left, right arms. We can build some interneurons, uh, interneuronal uh, networks of neurons. Uh, they will send signals to the motor neurons and they will send signals to the arms and we have the sensory feedbacks coming. So proprietive feedbacks, I mean signals coming from the body, and exteroceptive signals coming uh, from the environment of the system. So what kind of uh, mathematical model we can uh, propose from these um, uh, CPGs? First, uh, we can uh, propose uh, this uh, scheme on the right. I mean, we can propose that, okay, we will simplify the model of Pribac and Macria. We propose one neurons here, one neurons here for the flexor la uh, side, for the extensor side. And we will propose one neuron for formation levels and several neurons or one neurons for the motor neurons level. And we will have sensory feedbacks coming from the robots uh, that can send signals to the motor neuron levels, to the pattern formation levels, and to the rhythmic levels. But the main information is that at the rhythmic level, we must have neurons able to produce rhythmic activities. And the question is, how can, uh, what kind of uh, model of oscillating neurons we can use? And second, what, what kind of sensory feedbacks, what kind of signals we can uh, take from the robot to reproduce artificially the same model proposed in the, by the biologist. One model is very interesting, was proposed uh, several years ago by Robert Silverstone, Silverstone. This model is described here. I will not detail the equation, but what is important is that uh, uh, this model uh, describes the functioning of some neurons uh, inside the uh, coming from different models of, uh, neural ne of neurons, sorry. And this model is based on two uh, differential equations of the first order, and the two equations are 
coupled by a function f, and this function can um, have different shape, if I can say it like that, depending of two sig of of two um, parameters. For example, sigma f here and sigma s here. Depending of this parameter sigma, the function f can be linear, nonlinear, or nonlinear with a negative uh, uh, part here. And it is well known in physics that if we have this kind of uh, nonlinear part, then the system is like an oscillator. And we can reproduce here the four main uh, uh, behaviors of uh, oscillating, of these oscillating neurons, which can, which can be considered a, a, of a nonlinear oscillator. And so we have the um, um, oscillating um, 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 intrinsic oscillating behavior, the potential of plateau behavior, the ribbon post inhibition behavior, and the adaptation to the post inhibition adaptation uh, uh, behaviors. And these four main behaviors of neurons are very well known in biology and correspond to four main models of um, neurons uh, measure, measured by the measured by the. Um, um, by the biologist. And this, with this equation, then we can reproduce some behaviors of natural neurons, of biological neurons. And what is interesting with this model is that we can control the frequency of the oscillations. I mean, not frequency before uh, a threshold, after frequency. And then if we, um, if we characterize the uh, energy, cinetic energy index, of these uh, equations, we can have, depending on the two parameters, uh, an oscillator that is able to oscillate with di at different frequencies or not, uh, or can have non-oscillator behavior. Then I can control the oscillations depending only on two parameters. And because it is a non-linear oscillator, we can suppose that this oscillator, this neuron, can synchronize itself naturally with to exter external signals. Sorry, I have to accelerate because the time is going very fast. Um, so we can propose a mathematical model of these central pattern generators. And we reproduce here the equation of the same model, but uh, by using the van der Poel formalism. And van der Poel oscillators are very well known by the physics, by the physician. And I can detail now the CPGs on the right. So we have external input signals, which is the input of the rhythmic uh, neurons here, which is one neuron with this equation. And pattern formation neurons are here on the left. It's only sigmoidal functions. Uh, pattern and uh, motor neurons also are only sigmoidal functions. Um, and then we can add the two outputs, flexure, uh, extension, and flexion to generate um, a control value to control the robot joint. Okay, so the motor neurons are added to control the parameter of the robot joint, which can be a position or acceleration or, um, or, or force inside the motor joint, depending on the kind of robots we want to control. And of course, we have some feedbacks coming from the robot. And um, in, with my team, we succeed to implement some uh, uh, learning um, rules, local learning rules, in the neurons, which allow uh, the neurons to learn the frequency of the input signals. I, I will not detail these equations, but these equations show that the parameters which can control frequency can also adapt itself to, the to this external, external signal, signal F. And then the neurons, is a, the neurons here at the rhythmic generator level is able to synchronize itself to the external signals. We add some additional learning rules, but it's just to uh, increase the signals and to make the CPGs more sensitive to the external signals. So it is um, this uh, model uh, of learning rules is, was proposed by Riketty uh, several years ago, it's like a Nebian plasticity. Um, and then we implement a local Nebian plasticity rules in the neurons. And this allows the CPGs to adapt itself to um, 
external signals, I mean adapt its own frequency. And this is the main uh, interesting properties of the CPG because now we can suppose that these uh, uh, CPGs will control the robot and then will give the robot the, the, um, pro the, the um, property to synchronize itself to external signals. And this, the, uh, this um, what I will present to you now, it's some experiments based on this learning motor coordination. So one good example is, uh, we said the cuckoo in French, which is the halo between two persons. And we can reproduce this with the robot. Uh, so the robot is the robot Pepper, famous robot now in the world. So the robot is looking to the human, and the human is waving in front of the robot. And we implement two CPGs, uh, one for the shoulder, one on the elbow. And the visual signals uh, of the robot uh, is the input of the first CPG, and the output of this first CPG is the input of the second CPG. So by the learning rule we implemented, we suppose that the robot will be able to um, synchronize to what he is seeing in front of him. And this is the experiment, the first experiment, uh, with my uh, PhD student, Melanie. And um, this is a simple waving movement. And on the left, uh, on the right, sorry, uh, uh, the human person uh, has got on the hand an accelerometer, an uh, inertial unit uh, um, um, system able to measure the frequency of the movement. And then we can measure the synchronization between joints and the the optical flow, I mean what the robot is looking for. And you see the, the signals here. So at 20 seconds, the, the human accelerates his movement, and then the robot can synchronize and accelerate also his movement uh, with the human. So the, we can see here uh, the, some index of synchronization of uh, Yebian plasticity, the evolution of the different parameters. And this shows that uh, the robot is able alone to synchronize to the person without any global uh, learning rule. It's just some local um, local um, learning rule implementing the neuron model that uh, allows the system um, to emerge to a global uh, adaptive behavior. And we can see by the different experiments here uh, that uh, the fast portrait of the rhythmic cells is able of a dynamical system. And if we uh, do the same experiment several times, we can see by this uh, index measurement, because fast locking value, which is very well known in uh, computers, in uh, cognitive science and in neuroscience, sorry, uh, this index, uh, when it is close to one, means that the two signals are synchronized. And it is what we are seeing here. So at the beginning, we have the beginning of the learning, and the robot is not synchronized. And after, it's synchronized to the person. And when the person accelerates the movement, the robot changes its frequency and is going to a new synchronization. Um, of course, we can do the same with more complex movement. And you can see here the last experiment we did uh, one month ago. So we are doing a circle in front of the robot or in Finite sign, um, and um, we use some uh, exter exteroceptive signals coming from the, the camera of the robot to detect movement on the horizontal flow and vertical flow. And we can use these signals to control the two CPGs of shoulder and elbow and for the other shoulder. And we are able to show that the robot can synchronize itself to the persons. And what is interesting is that if the person is accelerating, the robot um, uh, converges to the signal of the person. So the robot is able to mimic the person itself without any programming before. We just use the property of synchronization of the oscillators to do that. And the last question is, can CPGs achieve both rhythmic and discrete movement? Uh, this model we proposed, uh, we used, sorry, is very interesting because when we set a value of the parameter to zero uh, by uh, looking at the equations, we can have finally this CPG able 
are like uh, a PID controller. It means that my CPG, which is an oscillator, can become a PID controller. And then we can control discrete movement. That is what we did on this experiment. So um, I restart the video. At the beginning of the simulation of the experiment, sorry, we have a camera looking the hand of the person. And this signals distance between the hand of the robot and the hand of the person is used to control uh, the CPGs. At the beginning, it is just a PID and the robot reached the person and after the robot is able to start a rhythmic movement. And then the robot is able to switch between a discrete movement and a rhythmic movement. And we can see on the bottom here the dynamical six that appears between the two uh, objects, the two dynamical systems. First dynamical system is a robot, second is a person. So that is very interesting because now we can suppose that we will uh, um, uh, do more complex uh, behavior between persons and robots, and then the robot will be able to interact physically with the person and to have um, coordination of his behavior with the movement of the person. You can see here the different trajectories of, um, of the CPGs and of the robot. So the di discrete trajectory and after the rhythmic trajectory. So it's time to conclude now. Um, so I show you that uh, we can use, uh, we can, if we can uh, design some controller inspired from biology. And these controllers um, are, uh, when we use the good model, can synchronize themselves to exter exter external signals. And then the robot is able to synchronize itself to these signals and if the signals are coming from the human, the, the robot is able to synchronize, synchronize itself to the human and then is able to work rhythmically with the human. Of course, this model, uh, this uh, approach is not based on any dynamical uh, model of the robot. We just use uh, this property of synchron natural synchronization. And of course, this kind of approach is not well used to um, do a very, uh, 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 um, accurate trajectory. It's for rhythmic tasks, then from cleaning, uh, sewing, something with the human, or more, working, lo wo working with the human, or interact with the human uh, at home, cleaning a table, or in the company, cleaning uh, uh, an object, for example. So finally, the last uh, conclusion is that um, dynamical control based on CPG are, is very efficient for robot rhythmic motions, for physical interaction with human and environment, but without need of accurate trajectory. And actually, we are uh, um, planning some new experiment and some new model where the robot is able to uh, interact with the human for uh, cleaning something, for sewing something, and the same robot can also uh, do another task, for example, saying, waving with a human. And then the robot, by waving and by working with a human, can be considered as a system able to be, uh, to have social interaction with a human and physical interaction with the human. So sorry for, um, for the time. And uh, now I, I can... Uh, try to uh, 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 um, respond to some questions. Sorry. Thank you very much for all. Uh, thanks so much, Patrick. Um, if you have any question, please use the mic. Hi, Patrick. Uh, Raj Desky Jolo here. Uh, I'm a computer scientist, too. and. Uh, recently affiliated with the College of Rehab Sciences. It is an interesting talk. All math uh, went uh, high above my head, but uh, that is not the point. It was a good uh, presentation anyways. Now you mentioned the pot potential applications uh, between the humans and the robots. Mostly you are teaching robots certain uh, actions, patterns, etc., etc. Did you uh, consider uh, its use, your approaches use, your robots use in rehab uh, domain? Rehabilitation, for example, instead of uh, 
human yes, uh, training. Uh, uh, what if you, you have uh, specifically tasked the robots training or rehab, uh, helping uh, patients uh, uh, for rehabilitation uh, domains? Yes. Observing their sorry. Observing their uh, rehabilitation yeah, yeah. progress. Yes, of course. We have also uh, some contact and we plan some new projects uh, about rehabilitation. For example, the human robot can synchronize itself to a human or, or we can control these uh, abilities of synchronization. So to help children, for example, to build uh, more uh, motor coordination, I think about uh, autistic children, for example, it can be interesting to uh, to look if this robot uh, can help the the the, the, the children to to um, to be more efficient in his um, condition of movement, specifically for rhythmic movement. So the robot can have movement in front of the persons, and the persons can try to do the same. And by switching uh, the controllers. Uh, to synchronization or not synchronization, we can, um, how can I say that? We can disturb this synchronization and then this disturb the human and maybe this can um, push or this can help uh, um, um, uh, this rehabilitation to be more uh, rapid or more efficient. Uh, we can do that also for uh, old persons, for example, we can implement some um, um, algorithms, some models to um, uh, interact rhythmically to an old person in a hospital and to uh, um, impose them some movement and then for to maintain a minimum of uh, rhythmic activity of uh, old person at home, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's possible for uh, rehabilitation, yeah. Uh, Patrick, I have another question, uh, while my colleagues maybe are looking for questions. Um, actually, I see a lot of um, potential for rehabilitation, especially when it comes to sending robots to uh, people's home to uh, train them and uh, monitor their training and, if, and like adjust their training, etc. And I see that you are in between rhythmic versus uh, non-rhythmic movements. And I... Curiously, just I want to understand what's the barrier to that. Is that uh, do you need to get more data from uh, the humans to train the deep learning uh, from computer science perspective, or to resolve the uh, anatomical problems of the robots itself? So, uh, what is the uh, barrier to uh, switching the, uh, from rhythmic movements to arrhythmic movements and helping the robot achieve much more? Um, uh, complex and diversified uh, movements. Yes, of course. Um, controlling the movement is not enough to uh, to to have a, I mean a, a good or a very uh, efficient robot at home or at work, specifically in rehabilitations. Uh, you talk about uh, deep learning, so you mean about uh, classification systems or more high level systems. Uh, in my presentation, I said that we can use external signals coming from uh, yes. environment of the robot, so uh, exteroceptive signals or coming from proprioceptive signals inside the body of the robot. But we can use also signals coming from another system based, for example, in deep learning, which able to um, um, uh, give some signals coming from uh, a different uh, learning task uh, did before, and then the robot can use these signals coming from this more high-level system, mm -hmm. for example, to, um, to to start some specific movement. Uh, I don't know, for example, waving or doing a circle or more complex movement, or saying, "Okay, now it's the moment to change to um, for rhythmic to discrete movement." So the parameter we use inside can be changed, can be modulated. Uh, can be influenced by external signals or by other signals. Mm -hmm. Well, that is the the what we plan to do in the future. Yeah. So modulate these parameters from 
a, a system, a more high level system. Mm -hmm. And just technically, do we uh, just technically do we need do we still need um, to place some sensors on the uh, participant, like the human uh, uh, body, to uh, give information to your robot, or your robot, as you explained in the second part of your presentation, can feed itself? Sorry, can you repeat? I didn't hear it really. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Uh, I mean, do, do we still need to place sensors on the uh, human body to uh, give information to the robot? Or the robot can imitate just using cameras like Hisense or Kinect or something like that to understand minimum information from the body and uh, apply some artificial intelligence to complete or uh, uh, achieve or um, uh, yeah. make the movement better? Yeah. Yes, that's a good question because uh, the, the aim we, uh, we, we have is to we don't want to equip the person to specific sensors. We use sensors on the person just for measurement, just to observe the signals. Uh, for example, we, we are um, actually preparing an experiment of some, ex a new experiment where we will analyze the brain uh, activities, EEG signals, yeah. and to observe uh, the difference uh, in the brain about when the person is interacted with a robot or with another person for the same task. So we don't want to equip the person with sensors, we just want to use the sensors of the robot. So the camera, for example, but also we can use uh, the force sensor on the robot, the torque sensors, the force inside the, the, Elbow. the joints. Yeah. And we do that in handshaking with the robot, so the person handshaking the robot, and we use the force measurement inside the robot, but this force coming from the physical interaction imposed by the person. So we don't want to use um, um, the signals, we don't, we don't want to equip the human to sensors, okay? Uh, that's, if, if, if not, it's not natural interaction. Great, and uh, just very small uh, questions. Uh, if your robot is equipped this way, uh, how, 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 how long it can work with people? Can it work for four hours or one day or? <laughs> Just to make it um, feasible to yeah. send robots in uh, people's home, yeah. Uh, we don't, uh, frankly speaking, we don't um, put the robot in the home of a person for the moment, but this robot, uh, we are limited by the technology, actually. Yeah. Uh, so the robot Pepper is very well known, it's not very expensive, uh, but it's not very solid robot we have uh, now, after several months, we have some problems in the motors, etc., etc. Mm. So we depend to we depend to the technology of robotics. Actually, if you want to use more robust robot, the cost then uh, reach immediately to several uh, hundred thousand of euros of dollars. So that's mm. the robot can interact to the persons, but um, uh, um, during several hours, it depends on the battery, depends on the um, of the robustness of the robot in terms of technology, it's like a computer. Mm -hmm. But um, globally, uh, if we want to interact continuously with the person, we must have effectively a more high system, more higher level system, uh, able to send signals to the controllers, to the motor controllers to say, okay, now you have to learn new rhythmic movement, now, now you will learn um, discrete movement, or you will uh, apply this movement only. So we have to um, um, to build the other levels of the global uh, controller of the robot, of course. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I'll see if we have another question in the room, maybe. Do we have questions? No, no, no. No more questions. That was really exciting, Patrick. Thanks so much. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing you again and uh, hearing you again presenting your uh, um, excellent work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, all persons. Thank you. Um, for me, it's a new exercise. First time I do that, so I hope it will be almost clear. And, um, and maybe in future we'll do uh, the same for another topic. <laughs>